Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to prayer meeting. Are you glad to be here? Yeah. Very excited for what God has for us tonight. Been really looking forward to tonight. But as you're giving and we're passing the buckets and um, getting ready for the next several weeks here at Oaks Church, I want to let you just know what's coming and you can be aware and be praying and even inviting people. This Sunday, we've got our welcome lunch. So for all those that are kind of new to our church or newer to our church, maybe some of your friends have started to come. You invited them, they came, they've been liking it, but they want to know more about it. I would just encourage you, have them come this Sunday to the welcome lunch after second service. I'm really excited to share with you that as of right now, I think this is our largest welcome lunch we've ever had. I think there's nearly 100 new people to our church already signed up for welcome lunch this Sunday. It's going to be a great one. Maybe you're here tonight and you're fairly new and you just uh, would want to have lunch with us and maybe hear a little bit more about our heart for the church and what we value and what we're about. It would be a great time. So that's one thing maybe that you could be aware of and inviting people to. The second thing is a week from this Sunday, so 10 days from right now, is the next time we're going to do water baptism. We call it Splash Party. And uh, I'm very excited about the next Splash Party. Um, lots of people already signed up. My son has some friends that uh, have given their life to Jesus from high school that he's excited to get to baptize. And, and uh, I'm just believing that there's going to be a lot of families here watching people get baptized that are going to find faith in Jesus. Amen. If you're here tonight, you've never been baptized in water. Maybe you were a little baby or, or uh, you don't remember making the decision to do that. And it's something that you, you need to do. And I say need because it is a command of Scripture. Jesus tells us to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we give our life to Jesus, the very first thing we're called to do is be baptized in water, to go public with our faith and to acknowledge that we're a part of this community of faith. If you've never done that, I would really encourage you to make that your next step. If you've got someone in your life that needs to do that, let them know it's coming up. And let's just believe for a great splash party and a lot of uh, new people into the family of God. Good things happening, right? Really exciting. I just want to take one more moment before I jump into the Word tonight and uh, let you know that right now, my wife Kara um, is preaching over at Oaks Youth tonight. And very, very excited for the message that she has for them. And it's just fun that we get to do this together as a family. It's a special night. Uh, me being with you, her being with them. And uh, can we just take a moment right now as she's probably about to take the stage if he hasn't done that already. And can we just pray over her? as she gets ready to deliver the word of God. Um, I don't know if you've ever preached to 400 teenagers. Not easy. So I just want to pray over her and just believe that the altar response, the time that is spent in the presence of God in, in response to the message is life-changing. Can we just do that real quick? Father, we pray for Kara. An anointing on her right now as she delivers your word. Pray for those students that they're ready to receive the word that she has for them, that you have for them. It's a word about identity. And the enemy is attacking this generation with issues of identity. God, I pray that you would speak the truth about who they are in you, the truth about identity. Pray that the word would rest on good soil. I pray that there's an incredible response. Miracles happen. I pray that many students give their lives to you tonight, and we tell stories for a long time about what you did at Oaks Youth on this night. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. I'll let her know you did that. Thank you for that. Well, I'm glad you're here at prayer meeting tonight. As we start tonight, a six-week series focusing on marriage. God put it in my heart months ago to do a series on marriage on Wednesday nights. Not Sunday mornings, but Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights is special because we have an opportunity to instantly apply what we just heard, and take it to the Lord in prayer. And so that's what we're driving towards, really, every Wednesday night, but certainly every week of this series, as we're talking about marriage, God can do more in a moment than we can do in a lifetime of talking about marriage. And I believe that tonight is going to be a night where God's going to turn it around in some of your marriages. I want you to know right from the beginning, is this is going to be a six-week series. Tonight we're kind of setting it up, and then we're going to get into it in the next few weeks. I want you to know right from the beginning, your marriage matters to God. Your marriage is a big deal to God. And your marriage is a big deal to this church. 
And so whether your marriage needs a a tune-up, which most of ours probably does, or your marriage needs a complete turnaround, overhaul, makeover, you need a miracle tonight. I think some of you have come as a last resort. Feel it in my spirit. Some of you have given up. And this is kind of the last chance. You heard on Sunday someone told you we're going to be talking about marriage. And you're like, well, maybe before I make that phone call to the lawyer, maybe we'll go. And you're here holding on to a thread of hope that something could change. I want to say I'm proud of you for being here tonight. I want you to know there is still hope for your marriage. There is still hope for your relationship. It is not too far gone. But we'll get to that in just a moment. I just want to say thank you for being here. There's a great crowd tonight at the Wednesday prayer meeting. And we're we're going to be really zooming in on two things over the next few weeks. Principles and prayer. When it comes to marriage, we've got to talk about principles. We've got to pray. We're going to go to God's Word. And we're going to look at the principles for healthy marriage. And we're going to spend time praying for our marriages. For the next six weeks, that's what we're focused on. The right principles from God's word. And we're going to bring it to the Lord in prayer. I would encourage you to get ready to activate your faith and to come ready to pray. Now, let me just give a word to those who aren't married in here. Maybe you're engaged. Maybe you're single. Uh, I don't know what your situation. I want you to know, when we go to God's Word and we talk about love and relationships, we talk about principles of marriage, it applies to everybody, all right? So don't tune out and don't, you know, stop coming because we're talking about marriage. I promise you that it's going to impact your life too. And if you're not married, you're single, you want to be married one day, you want to be married again one day you want to learn the lessons from the first time and and maybe apply them better the second time, Uh, I want you to, to become the kind of person someone else would want to marry. And the way we do that is by we go to God's word and not culture to become the person that God wants us to be. You're going to learn that in this series. And so we're talking about marriage. Listen, marriage is hard. The enemy attacks us at the point of our deepest, most important relationships. But the glory of God shines brighter. And the church of Jesus Christ is stronger when our marriages are healthy. Marriage is the foundation of this church. They're really the foundation of society. When those begin to break down, everything breaks down. And we're seeing that across the country. We're seeing that even in the church. And so we're bringing our weakness. We're bringing our desperation. We're bringing everything to the table in this series. And we're saying, God, we surrender it to you. Help us. Heal us. Fix us. Speak to us. Do a miracle in the name of Jesus. And so that's what we're praying for and uh, my, heart is, my heart is a bit heavy, I'm going to be honest with you, but I'm also very excited because I have been praying, our team has been praying, and we are expecting God to move. And I hope you come, keep showing up, keep coming for the next several weeks. Um, just also, part of what we're doing is we're, we're looking at some of the principles from God's Word, but that are discussed in this book called The Four Laws of Love by Jimmy Evans. Uh, Karen and I read this book early this year, And it really impacted us. It really helped us in a lot of ways. And so part of this is we want to pass on what we're learning to you. And so we're not, I'm not preaching from this. Uh, I'll use some principles here and there. Uh, But if you really want to go deeper and you really want to do some work on your marriage, I would encourage you to buy this book at our store. We've gotten um, a couple hundred copies ready to purchase. And uh, if you want to dive deeper into the principles we're talking about, I would encourage you to get this book. Start reading it together uh, as a couple. We'll reference it through the series. Uh, but I think it would uh, be an, an important resource for you. So I just wanted to show you that and let you know we've got copies available for you after service to buy at our Oak store. Well, Kara and I have been married for 23 years. I always say, I know it doesn't look like we're that old, but uh, we are in fact that old. Uh, 23 years, we dated for four years uh, before that. And our marriage started like most marriages do. We met, we fell in love, we got married, we went on a honeymoon. Anybody remember their honeymoon? Some of you, it was a long, long time ago. And uh, uh, I was reflecting on my honeymoon 23 years ago, and um, we got to go to the Bahamas. Now, I know not everybody gets to go to a place like that. Uh, my grandparents 
gifted us that trip. They were so generous to do that. And so I was 21 years old, and Kara was 20 years old. We were babies, and our first trip anywhere outside the normal United States was on our honeymoon to the Bahamas. And I was thinking about it this week, what an amazing trip it was, and I'm like, we were too young and stupid to even appreciate the trip that we had. I need that trip right now. <laughs> Give me my honeymoon back right now. I want to go today. Now I would appreciate it. Now I would know. Well, I would savor every moment. I, back then, uh, you know, uh, you just didn't appreciate it. Too young, too naive. You just thought, well, this is just real life. But it's not real life, you know. And I, I don't know if the honeymoon thing is a very healthy paradigm to start relationships on. I don't know where it started. I don't know how it began that you would get married and go away on a, a fancy trip. And uh, I don't know that it's helpful to start your first week married setting unrealistic expectations. You spend a week in a place you'll never be able to really live, doing things you can't afford, using money that's not yours, with a team of people waiting on your every need, Nothing but free time for all the activities, if you know what I mean. It's just not real life. It's just not how real life works. And so you start your relationship with unrealistic expectations and in some ways like all downhill from here, you know. You, you go back home and, and then you start to have some some tension or some problems, and, and all of a sudden you start to fight, maybe for the first time, and some people around you go, well, I guess the honeymoon's over. Yeah, I guess so. Now all of a sudden, real life happens. We each go to work. We come home, and we got to share our space with somebody else. And it's kind of like there's a stranger there because you're learning all kinds of things you did not know before you were sharing space with one another. And part of you, you won't say it out loud, but like, I kind of liked it when we each went back to our own apartments. <laughs> sharing space. I don't know about all of this. You learn things you didn't know. You see things you didn't see. He's sloppy. <laughs> she doesn't cook like my mama cooks. All we ever ate was Chipotle before we got married. Now I'm Eating or cooking for the first time. Mama didn't cook it that way. God help you if you say it out loud, right? <laughs> real problems, real challenges. You're working hard. You got no money. All of a sudden, you know, you're, you're starting to argue about things you never argued about before. And you say to yourself a few years in, oh, I know what will help all of this. Let's have kids. That'll make everything better. And so you start having kids and... Then all of a sudden, she's spending all of her attention on the kids, and she's got nothing left for you. And so you pour all of your focus on work and hanging out with your friends, and you, start, you stop being attentive to her needs, and everything starts to drift a little farther apart. And so you spend more, you work more, you focus on the kids even more. All the while, you're just looking for fulfillment, but as time goes by, you realize, I think we're drifting apart. And we're just passing each other. We're just roommates. We're kind of co-workers raising these kids. We've lost the spark. It's not like it used to be. Then one day the kids move out. And some of you have come to this point. The last one moves out of the house. Karen and I are getting ready for the first one here in about a year to move out of our house. And before we know it, the last one will move out of our house. And if you're not careful, the kids move out of the house and you have nothing left to say to one another because you realize all we ever talked about was the kids. Keeping things moving, keeping things going, getting them where they were supposed to be, making sure everything was taken care of. And then one day you wake up, it's just you and her, it's just you and him. And you have nothing left to say to one another. And that's when the neglect begins to ring in your ears. That's when the hurt feelings come rushing in. That's where the broken trust really begins to take its toll. You've spent years drifting apart, and now it's real. And I know some people, maybe even in this room right now, you've told yourself, as soon as the last one's out of the house, that's it. I can't do this anymore. I'm going to stay together for the kids, but when the last one's gone... I'm out. It's what people say because slowly over time, 
this is what happens. It's sad what I just described to you, but it's true for far too many people, that life cycle of marriage. Studies show as most couples get older, they've done research on this, as most couples get older, their satisfaction in marriage gets lower. It really kind of is. You go on your honeymoon, and it's slowly downhill from there. I mean, that's a joke maybe to say, but for too many people, it is their reality. It's a slow bleed from there. They get older, satisfaction in marriage gets lower. Can I tell you, this is not God's plan for marriage, and it doesn't have to be your reality. To break that cycle, the one that I described, we need to understand God's design and God's laws for marriage. We need to understand God's design and God's laws. We've got to stop being informed by culture, by talk shows, by movies, by music, by your girlfriend, by your bros that you hang with on the weekends, by all the other things that shape our view of relationships and marriage. We have got to remove, we've got to unlearn all of that. And we've got to go back to the word of God. God's design and God's laws for marriage. So in his book that I showed you, Four Laws of Love, Jimmy Evans, who spent his whole life as a pastor and author really writing about this topic, marriage. He says the universal need of all human beings is love. That's no surprise. It wouldn't strike us as unusual that that would be the universal need that we all have. And there's nothing better than when we're truly loved, accepted, that you have that relationship that's pure and you're safe. There, there's just nothing better in life than when you are loved by someone else. And there's nothing really worse than when you're rejected, unloved, when that relationship is broken and fractured. It, it cuts at, a, at a, a pain level that's hard to describe when that happens. Nothing better than being loved, nothing worse than being Unloved. Marriage is God's design for us to reveal his love to the world. Yes, part of why God established marriage is that through the covenant relationship of marriage, the world would see a loving God. I wonder how many people across the nation and around the world look at the marriages inside the church and see the love of God. Or they look at the marriages of people who call themselves Christians and they see really a lot of what they see in everybody else. Marriage was intended to show something different. Marriage was intended to show the kind of love that God has for the world. But too often we're showing a story and we're showing an image of God that's not what he ever wanted us to, to show. So here's the big idea that really he unpacks in his book and that I want to start with tonight as we begin to get into these principles. He writes, this is a quote, I'm going to just quote this. God created love and marriage... And he created laws to guide them. When God's laws are honored, marriage is the safest relationship on earth and love is promoted and protected. I understand for many of us in this room, marriage may not have been the safest relationship on earth. In fact, marriage may have been the source of so much hurt, heartache, and pain. But you can't let what's wrong with you or others get in the way of what's right with God. Because God intended marriage to be the safest relationship on earth where love could be promoted and protected. When God's laws are violated, it diminishes or destroys the environment necessary for true and lasting love. And so, really, this is a simple proposition. I know relationships, marriage, it's never really that simple. But when you think of it in terms of God designed and God created laws and we abide by them, our love with each other is protected. When we violate those laws, there's harm done. It makes a lot of sense. It does simplify complex things. So I want to say if you're struggling in your marriage, if you've gone through an enormous amount of pain, if you're here tonight as a last-ditch effort, it may not be you've fallen out of love. That's what we, people say. 
I've just, I don't love them anymore. I've fallen out of love. It may not be you chose the wrong person all those years ago. And that's what we can convince ourselves too. I just, I made a bad choice 20 years ago, so why should I have to suffer for a bad choice I made? 20? We tried, we tried to make it work, we can't make it work. It may not be any of the things we allow our minds to assume that it is. The reason that we're going through what we're going through may in fact be we have violated the laws for love and marriage in God's word and those laws and love need to be reestablished. And if we reestablish God's laws for love and marriage, your marriage can be restored. I believe that's true for everyone in here, those watching online. I believe it's not too late. I believe when you take God's word and let it take root in your heart, that miracles can happen. And if you violated these laws, you can reestablish them and your marriage can thrive. So here's the four laws of love. They all come from one passage in Scripture and then really the rest of Scripture affirms these. It starts when God creates marriage in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. Of course, we've been in the book of Genesis for a long time. We were in chapter 2, um, when was that? I don't even know. Last year, early this year, I can't even remember when we started the series on Genesis. We didn't do a deep dive on this passage. So the next few weeks, we're actually going to do a deep dive on these two verses. It's where these four laws come from. Here are the four laws of love from Genesis chapter 2. It's the law of priority, the law of pursuit, the law of partnership, and the law of purity. The law of priority, the law of pursuit, the law of partnership, and the law of purity. Write those down. Because over the next four weeks, we're going to unpack each one of those individually. Tonight we're setting the table. Tonight we're just getting ready. Tonight really is about establishing hope and belief and preparing ourselves for this journey. But each week from here on, we'll unpack one of these laws, and then we'll close it on the last week. These come from Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 to 25, and here's what it says. As God is creating man and woman, he establishes marriage at the end of chapter 2, and here's what he says in verse 24. It's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. You say, how do you get four laws of love and marriage from those two verses? Well, when you really zoom in and break it down, the, the scripture is saying a lot right here. A man leaves his father and mother at that time to honor and to be with, to live under the authority of your father and mother was the highest priority. They were the highest relationship that you adhered yourself to. And so to leave that relationship and prioritize another relationship would mean you prioritize that over all else. You leave your father and your mother. The priority is now your spouse. The law of pursuit, and you are united to your wife. She becomes the pursuit of your life. He becomes the pursuit of your heart. You spend your life being united, chasing unity, pursuing in relationship, learning and knowing and loving in a more intimate way all the time. And they become one flesh. It's the law of partnership that God would bring together physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally for a purpose. It's partnership. And when you find that, you find a wonderful thing. And they were naked and they felt no shame. Why? Because they were living in perfect purity. It's the law of purity. Sin hadn't entered the world yet. Things were pure. The law of priority, the law of pursuit, the law of partnership, the law of purity. When these laws of love and marriage are honored, love is protected, love is safe, your marriage is strong. When these are violated, any one of them at really any level, your marriage is fractured. Love becomes a little less safe. 
And ultimately, heartache and pain can come if these laws continue to be violated. So over the next few weeks, we're going to break down each one of these (coughs) laws individually, and we're going to pray them into our lives. That's the real power of what we're doing on Wednesdays, is you're not just learning concepts. We're going to pray them into our lives. In the meantime, again, get the book. Show up every week. Let's ask God to give us hope for our marriages. That's really what I want to get across to you tonight. Is if we could tonight, on this first week, do anything, I pray that we, we could establish there's still hope. There's still time. Don't make the call. Don't give up. Don't move out. Don't call it quits. I know it's bad. I know what he did makes you feel like you could never see a future. I know what she said has cut you to a core that you could never unhear what you said. I know it may feel like things could never go back to the way they were. But if we could have anything tonight, and maybe God would need to do this miracle at the altar tonight, is just birth hope, not solutions, not fixes yet, but hope. Some of you are divorced. You've come out of a painful relationship. You're finding it hard to trust men again. You're finding it hard to trust women because of what she did. And you're single and you've given up on love in that way. I pray that God fills you full of hope tonight. To just lean in a little bit more. Just get back in your car and come next Wednesday. To listen to one more week. To tune in one more time. To walk the aisle just one more time. Say, God, here I am one more time. If we could, we could cling to hope tonight, then we have a chance. We have a chance. Maybe things do seem too far gone. Maybe you think they're too bad. Can't be turned around. But like we sang, God can turn it around. And I'm believing a trickle of hope can turn into a flood if we put our faith in Jesus. That's what this is about. I, my prayer has been like our church has almost become known as, as a church that believes for signs and wonders. We, we pray every week for divine healing and we're hearing testimonies every week of people getting healed. Every week. It's almost become like our reputation. That's the church that prays. That's the church that believes people can get healed. I love that. I love that when I hear other people say it about our church. My heart has been also that we would add to that. Oh, that's the church. They believe marriages can be restored. That's the church. I'm telling you, everybody I talk to that goes over there that's in trouble, man, their marriage gets turned around. They're more in love than they've ever been. We're seeing miracles happen in marriages. I pray that we become that church that's all about marriage. That's all about building healthy marriage. That miracles happen in our relationships. Miracles happen in our marriages. I know there was an affair. I know the trust was broken. I know they ran off. I know they left. I know they did you wrong. But God can turn it around. God can do a miracle. It is never too late. And when those stories, oh, let me tell you something. You think think it's powerful when people get healed physically? Let me just tell you, when marriages come back together after the worst has happened, the shock waves through a community, the shock waves through your generational lineage, the shock waves that come, God does a move. God brings incredible healing. The Bible's full of passages that give us hope. Let me give you a few before we get ready to go to the altar tonight. In fact, why don't you go ahead and stand to your feet? I want to read these over you. I'm going to invite you just to come and spend a few minutes. And if you came with your spouse, if you came with your girlfriend, if things are tense, I don't know what the situation in the room is tonight, to be honest with you. I would encourage you to come together, kneel before the Lord, posture yourself to say, okay, here we are. No clue what to do, no clue what to say. Things are a little icy around the house. But we're not giving up. To position yourself at the altar and just spend some time listening to the Lord, spend some time talking to Him, maybe reach your hand over and grab hers, maybe put your hand on His shoulder, and let's begin to position ourselves tonight in these next few weeks for God to do a miracle. I'm going to 
invite you in a moment to come and just be at the altar in the presence of the Lord. It's where miracles happen. It's where hope is born. In Genesis chapter 50, we're going to get there before too long. Genesis chapter 50, Joseph says to his brothers who had tried to kill him something that we need to start saying to the enemy of our soul. You intended to harm me by destroying my marriage, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Your marriage coming back together, getting strong, and getting healthy will result in the saving of many lives. John 10, 10, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I, Jesus, have come that you may have life and have it to the full. The enemy of your soul has been trying to tear down your marriage. It's not as much him. It's not as much her. There's a real devil. And he's trying to tear you apart. Recognize it for what it is. Turn your eyes on Jesus and say, I know the enemy has been trying to come against us. He's brought us and made us act at our worst, but you've come to give us life. So come now, come now, right now. Give us life, Lord Jesus. Turn it around. That's what you said you would do in Revelation 21.5. Oh, it's the end of all things. And Jesus himself says, behold, I am making all things new. One day. We're going to be in heaven with Jesus, a finish line to all the pain and the problems of his life. And all things will be once and for all made new. Until then, Jesus says, I'm in the process of partnering with you to make all things new, including marriages. Your marriage can be made new because that's who he is and that's what he does. So I'm going to pray right now and open up these altars and just invite you to come and spend some time in prayer. We've got 16 minutes. And let's just see what God would do. Save my Bible for me. I'm gonna need that. Let's just see what God would do. So Lord, we're ready to hear from you. We're desperate. We don't have the answers. The enemy has been at work and there's a lot of scar tissue on our lives. There's a lot of warning signs, the check engine light has come on in our marriage and we're a little nervous, we're a little scared. It's a new territory for us. We don't quite know what to do. Some of us are here, things are good, and we want to safeguard, we want to know, we want to learn, we want to gird up under your authority and make sure our marriages stay strong. So whatever the situation, God, begin to minister to your people love, grace, mercy, more than anything tonight, I pray that you would instill supernatural hope against all odds. Hope, Lord, that things could be better than what they are today. In the name of Jesus, begin to do your work right now tonight. Amen. Come, let's spend some time with Jesus.
If you're down here praying, I don't want you to, I don't want you to leave. Stay right here. But I want to set up a song that we're going to sing. And we really want to sing this song over you tonight. Over all of our marriages. It's a, a song of expectation and a song of hope. And faith, when you can't see a whole lot of reason to have faith. We're going to sing this over your marriages. And it comes from 1 Kings chapter 18. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah is the man of God. He's the prophet of God. And there's a severe famine in the land. It's bad. People are suffering. And there's spiritual warfare going on among the people because Israel has a wicked king. And they've turned their attention off the things of God. You could say they've turned their attention off the laws of love and the laws of marriage, off the things of God, and they've turned it towards culture and false gods and false prophets. So there's a famine in the land. And in my spiritual eyes, I just feel like in a lot of our marriages, there's a famine. It's a drought. We haven't had rain for a while. We're struggling. We're barely making it say that about the church in America and marriage is the state of marriage. You could say that about a lot of things. It's drought. It's famine in the land. Spiritual warfare going on. But God raises up a voice, Elijah, who begins to prophesy and he goes to the wicked king, Ahab, and he says, you get 450 of your false prophets and have them meet me up at Mount Carmel. We're going to do some battle." I'll take all of them on all by myself. Because, listen, if we want to see marriages turn around, if we want to see this community turn around, somebody's got to rise up with some righteous indignation and say, I'll do battle. I'll tell the enemy to shut up. I'll tell him he can't have Oaks Church. I'll tell him he can't have my family. I'll go meet him up on the mountain. I'll do some warfare. I'll stand in. Elijah did that. 
righteous indignation. And so he goes up there full of faith. And if you ever want to just get pumped up, read 1 Kings 18, because it is a chapter of trash talk with Elijah towards these false prophets. And he proves to them in dramatic ways that the God of Israel is greater than all of these false prophets. And he humiliates them, and then he has them all killed. It's awesome. Then he says to the wicked king, you better go eat and prepare yourself because there's a storm coming. The rain is on the way. And he prophesied after a long season of drought, God was about to bring the rain. But somewhere along the way, Elijah got a little insecure, kind of like Pastor Greg talked about on midnight with Peter. Whoa, I'm walking on water. Whoa, I just prophesied something I don't know how to make happen. And so all of a sudden he starts feeling like it's up to him and he gets a little insecure and he goes up on top of Mount Carmel again and he's got his buddy with him and it says his hand is in between, his head is in between his knees and I think he's freaking out a little bit because he prophesied rain and he doesn't know how to make it rain. Oh God, please bring the rain. We need a miracle. God, do something. You gotta show up. I wrote a check I don't know if I can cash. I've been up here tonight talking about God's going to do miracles in our marriages. I can't make that happen. There aren't enough pastors at this church. There aren't enough hours of counseling. There aren't enough good books to read. There aren't enough principles to unpack for us to fix what's going on in your life and in your marriage. God's going to have to do it. There's part of me is like, don't do a series on marriage. You don't know what's going to happen. Don't pray for the sick up here. You can't heal them. I just feel like, you know what? I'm willing to put myself, we're all willing to put ourselves out there on the line and say, all we know to do is to do what God tells us to do. He's going to have to do the miracle. It's on him, not on us. So Elijah tells his buddy, I just just prophesied it's going to rain. I don't know how to make it rain. Let's go up and look out the sea and see if we see any clouds. So I want you to go and look at the ocean. Do you see any clouds out there? The guy comes back. No, I don't see anything. Doesn't look like rain to me. Well, would you go look again? Six times he tells them, go back and look again. He's just desperate. Keep showing up. Keep coming to church. Keep opening your word. Keep coming to the altar. Go look again. One more time would you go look and see if it's about to rain. One more time would you come on a Wednesday night. One more time would you show up at the altar? One more time would you say, I'm not going to give up today. Maybe tomorrow, but I'm not going to give up today. Would you go look one more time and see if you see any clouds? On the seventh time, his buddy walks out. Here's what he says. I see a cloud as small as a man's hand. It's rising from the sea. A glimmer of hope. I can barely see it. But I, it's there. And some of you tonight, I just wanted you to see a cloud as small as a man's hand off in the distance. It hasn't rained yet. Your marriage isn't fixed yet. The miracle hasn't happened yet. But the faith that rose up in Elijah was, ah, go tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. It's about to storm a flood of God's mercy and grace and hope and love and redemptive power over your marriage. I know right now it's not raining. I know right now you still are living in the pain and in the problem, but I'm telling you, if you could just look out and see, it's tiny, but there it is. Hope is on the way. So just receive this song tonight. And let's believe that it's true what's about to happen in our church, what's about to happen in your marriage, and let our faith rise up. The point of tonight, we'll get to the principles next week. The point of tonight is that God would birth hope in our hearts. Let's sing, but more than anything, let's receive this song over us. Come on, lead us. Hear the word roaring his thunder with a new 
future to tell for the dry season is over there is a cloud beginning to swell to the skies heavy with blessings Lift your eyes, offer your heart. Jesus Christ, open the heavens. Now we receive the Spirit of God. We receive your Every seed buried in sorrow, you will call forth in this time. be full of hope and expectation. Don't go to the how. Let's look to the who and believe these next few weeks as we just keep showing up, as we dive deep, God's going to do a miracle. So let's seal it right now before we go. Lord, we thank you for what you've spoken. 
We receive that message. And I pray, Lord, that our emotions could catch up with those words, that our mind could catch up. Lord, I pray that we would forget some things and begin to remember other things. Namely, you're faithful and you're good and you love us and you're leading us. So lead us towards healthy marriages, to healing, to restoration, to redemption, to wholeness. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining Oaks Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. That's right. And we want to let you know that we would love to connect with you through our online family in our OC Online Facebook group. To do that, you can like our Oaks Church page and click Join Group. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll have access to life-giving sermons and worship that will be a blessing to you and your family. Yeah, we'd love to have you join us live for our Sunday and Wednesday services. We hope you have a great day today. Thank you for watching and God bless.